So now we're going to switch perspectives just a little bit and think about the protein that we get from food and how the we det- we kind of think about the quality of that protein, how much protein we need, those sorts of things. Again, some of this is kind of basic information that you've gotten from other coursework, but just thinking of it in the context of, okay, we know um, how our bodies digesting and absorbing, but how do we know that the the protein coming in is actually going to be able to be utilized in that way? So we'll look at that just a little bit. So one way that protein quality can be evaluated is that foods can be categorized as complete proteins or incomplete proteins. And sometimes this is also referred to as either high quality or low quality proteins. Um, There's, I... I don't necessarily love those terms, high quality and low quality. I think they sort of uh, misrepresent to an extent uh, some of the proteins. But the idea here is that complete proteins contain all of the amino acids that our body require, the essential amino acids, not that our bodies require, but that our bodies require from food. So all of the essential amino acids, whereas an incomplete protein lacks one or more of those amino acids. So the example on the slide here shows um, some food sources of incomplete proteins on the left. So, um, for example, wheat, rice, some of these, and then the limiting amino acids. So basically the limiting amino acid means that's an essential amino acid, one that our body needs, but these incomplete proteins, these specific foods, don't contain that amino acid. So does that mean that these are useless proteins? Absolutely not, because if we're eating a variety of foods, then we will likely get the lysine or the tryptophan or or whatever is lacking um, from another type of food. Now, it used to be thought um, in the nutrition world that, for example, if someone was a vegetarian, which um, vegetable sources of protein often are, incomplete proteins. And so vegetable sources of protein needed to be combined in a very particular way. So we looked at one food source that was um, had some limiting amino acids and then complemented that with a food source that contained that particular amino acid. So altogether, we'd have this complete protein. That is no longer felt to be true as long as the person is, you know, over the day and days eating a variety of foods, a variety of, you know, plant protein sources that's going to give them that. Our body does have a little bit of an ability to hold on to some of those amino acids. So we don't need to do very detailed um, protein combining in one meal. Again, this idea of high quality and low quality, I also um, don't uh, necessarily love those terms. I think um, because the high quality are, are generally going to be or the complete proteins, animal products, the low quality or incomplete are plant products. But I, I think there's plenty of research to support that we can have um, a high quality diet and plenty of protein that's going to serve us well from pr- plant sources. So I think that can be a little bit misleading. But this is the idea here. Um, and just again, remembering that it's no longer felt that you have to do really intricate um, uh combining of proteins if someone's following a vegetarian diet. So here's some different ways that um, protein quality can be evaluated in more a numeric way. So um, one thing that is is used for evaluating protein quality is this protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. So a long name, um, and this is actually what's used on the percent daily value on food labels. And kind of the idea behind this is, and really behind all of these um, different ways of looking at it, is saying, okay, we can look at the absolute amount of protein in a food, but let's look at how our body actually handles that and how much of that protein we can actually utilize. And so these different ways of evaluating protein quality basically try to account for some of that. The protein efficiency ratio is actually used um, in baby foods. Again, how, how well do we convert that protein into what our bodies actually need? You'll see biological value used a lot in, um, in the literature in terms of um, protein in disease states. You see it a lot when you look at um, health conditions that need to restrict protein intake. Sometimes, for example, in kidney disease, when a person's having a low amount of total protein intake, they really want to have 
um, proteins of high biological value, basically meaning that the body can utilize everything that they're getting. So if we don't get very much protein altogether, we want it to be really good stuff that our body can use. So that's kind of the idea behind these ways of evaluating protein quality. Um, I would say those first three are ones that are um, most, most commonly used, I would say, or referenced in literature, or used on food labels, things like that. So being familiar with the idea behind those and why that might be important as you're thinking about not just total protein intake, but actually how our body can use that protein. So the last slide that I have here in this unit is, again, what I would expect to be very much review in terms of recommended protein and amino acid intake. Um, the RDA for adults is 0.8 grams per kilogram. If you calculate that out, it's not all that much. Um, and we really haven't, there hasn't been good solid evidence that there's negative effects of higher protein intakes, assuming someone has normal kidney function and, and those sorts of things. So assuming a, a healthy individual. Um, the acceptable macronutrient distribution range um, is 10 to 35 percent of cal calories, so quite a wide range there. Um, so again, it most, you know, depending on the the population in the United States, most people get much more than this uh, RDA value. They really, you know, most people don't have to struggle to meet that. So, um, but, but we don't really have a reason to think that a higher intake is necessarily uh, negative. However, you know, there's, there's different thoughts there. In terms of food sources and things like that, again, I'm expecting that you have that uh, from prerequisite coursework, but certainly you do want to think about those different food sources, and because um, animal foods and meats uh, are the highest source of protein, they have a lot of protein content, if someone is a vegetarian, you do want to make sure to help them look and, and evaluate their diet for adequate protein intake, but it is certainly um, very doable to meet the adequate protein intake with a vegetarian diet. So just kind of to wrap up this, this piece, um, keeping in mind that, that digestion and absorption and then this protein quality, so really thinking about the process, um, how what, what protein is in the food, and then once it comes into the body, how we're able to break it down, um, absorb it, and, and transport it out so we can actually utilize it.